Well, you know, when you buy it, you can just cross off the end. There you go. Get your Sharpie just out. Just scratch it out. Yeah. Like, Why is the box damaged here? Because <laughs> it's great. an adjective. <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible, Doc and Chris discuss mobile games at length, including Fallout Shelter, Coup, and Hearthstone. Plus, a button mosh, some table talk, and a new segment about Let's Plays. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Backward Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 32 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined by Doc. Hey, hey. And uh, today we're also joined by uh, Arwen the Cat, who has taken up residence here uh, right by the microphone. So if you hear the sound of tongue on fur, um, it's probably the cat. Yeah, it might be me, though. Mm. Yeah, we'll just blame it on the cat. Well, it's... Oh, well, yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah. It's totally the cat. It's totally the cat. Jim's not going to be able to join us today, unfortunately. He had some stuff come up and was not able to make it. So uh, today it's just going to be me and Doc. Uh, but before we start the show proper today, we wanted to um, report a little bit of sad news. Um, Richard Worth, who is um, one of the co-founders of Backward Compatible, he's been on the podcast uh, actually fairly recently. Um, his wife, Kim, passed away, um, uh, I think it was like five hours out from their uh, new home in Pennsylvania. Um, came very suddenly. Um and, uh, yeah, just very young. It's That's very super sad. sad. Yes. Um, so we wanted to uh, go ahead and dedicate this episode to uh, Kim Worth um, and to Richard. Um, love you, bud. Um, we also like to let you guys know that the um, there's a GoFundMe campaign going on right now to uh, support uh, Richard and family while this is going on. Um, we're going to be linking that in... Um, the description for this podcast and on our website it's also available on our facebook page um but if you want it right now the url is gofundme.com slash kim worth that's k-y-m-w-i-r-t-h and uh, any support you guys can throw their way would be uh, very much appreciated i'm sure yeah that's a really cool thing mm. and i think richard and his daughter are going to uh, be okay for now because of that but uh we're uh, definitely, definitely joining him in his sadness over mm-hmm. this. Yep, Kim was a very, uh, very cheerful, very kind lady, and uh, she's going to be missed by a lot of people. Brightened up a room, for sure. Yep, for sure. Um, I guess we should go ahead and get back to the podcast, though. So, um, here, here. What do we have coming up first? Well, uh, it looks like it's time for Button Mosh. Button Mosh. For the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Well, aside from uh, the game that we're going to be talking about very soon, which I will not spoil, mm. uh, I think I, we, I think we've already said what it's coming up. Oh, so, so so I can actually I can actually say transistor. Yes, we can say okay. transistor. I've been playing a lot of so, transistor. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were going to do that this week, but because Jim's not here, we're pushing it back. Yeah, so, so that's totally fine. But big suspense for you guys. Um, cool game. Give you a chance to to go play it and beat it because it's a pretty short game. Yes, uh, and then you can shout at your computer whenever you uh, hear the things that we say and be like, "You guys are wrong. <laughs> You're totally wrong." Yes. Um, so there's your heads up and your warning mm-hmm. and. Uh, so if you don't want spoilers, just go play the game before we put out that podcast. Exactly. That, that's a really good point, because we're, <laughs> we're going to spoil the heck out of that yeah. thing. Um, but aside from that, actually, I've been spending a lot of time in mobile, and we're going to actually talk about that today. That's our mm-hmm. sort of meaty topic for today. Yep. But, um, you know, I, I really have to disagree with a lot of the reviews for the brand new uh, Fallout Shelter mm. that has come out. Um, I am addicted to it. I am loving it. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I, it's very much a tower game, not a tower defense game, mm-hmm. mind you, but it's a tower game yes. that is more um, organized than a tower, mm-hmm. and it is super fun. So I'm going to talk more about that when we get to that segment. But um, other than that, yeah. I, I think we're controlling Mobile Minute and Button Mosh right now because Mobile Minute is all about the games that play without buttons. So this is Whoa. Button Mosh for game with oh, buttons. Oh, that's, that's deep. Yes. That's super. So <laughs> what, you're, what you're actually saying to me mm-hmm. is that mobile games are not games. I'm saying they're not button mosh games. 
because they don't have buttons. Yeah. And again, I suppose there are games that we would, would mention on Button Mosh that don't use buttons. You know, so. Jim's going to be very disappointed this is the first time we fought during a Button Mosh. <laughs> and he's not, not here. here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. But no, uh, in all seriousness, though, yes, mobile games are games. Well, I, I beat Broken Age. Mm hmm. I was satisfied with it. Okay. Um, so I, no, I, no, no re redaction. No, there. no re re um, re redaction. Yes, <laughs> uh, retraction. Whatever. But um, or, yeah, retraction. Retraction. Redaction, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what. A re- well, I know what a redaction yes. is. But uh, <laughs> I, I'd like to redact Tim Schafer for a few things. Uh, somebody <laughs> needed to redact the the script on it, mm. um, and I still stand by it being childish at the very beginning. But the the ending is solid. Um, there there are a few. Th- things about it that I'd be like, eh, okay, but it's a, it's an adventure game. you got to have a little tongue-in-cheek kind of an attitude about it, or else it just, mm. you know, it's not an adventure game. Yeah, yeah. You can't take it too seriously. <laughs> but it very much is, there's the right way to do it, and you've got to do it in that order, and if you try everything with everything, you eventually will beat the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and... It, I don't know. Is it is it cheating nowadays to, to consult the internet and actually look for a solve or two? Because uh, there was one moment in there... Um, where you had to kind of reprogram a, a robot, mm-hmm. and, but in the first time it was like, okay, I get it, I figured it out, it, I understand the the symbolism, mm-hmm. and then I realized, oh no, this is a new skill set that I'm supposed to have, and I'm going to have to do this five or six times over the course of the game. The biggest problem that I had with it actually came from the fact that you're supposed to switch between the two main characters. Um, one is named. Uh, Vela and the other one's named Shay, mm-hmm. and so you're switching between Vela and Shay's stories. And there's a neat moment where they cross over into each other's set, if you will, or mm-hmm. setting. Um, and so that's kind of fun because you've been there before, but not with that character. And so you see it through two different characters' eyes. Oh. The problem is, you have to take information that you get while looking through Vela's eyes, and she's on a spaceship, mm-hmm. and apply it in Shay's world. I see, uh, which is really her world, except Shay's there now. And it makes no narrative sense at all for you to be able to just intuitively reprogram the robot mm. by using the manual mm. that she finds and the image that she sees and that sort of a thing, unless he had foreknowledge of it, which I guess you could argue. But it, I don't know. It's, it really it's interesting because we start getting into the discussion that we have in tabletop role playing, which is player knowledge versus character knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, and that's exactly and right. They're, they're wanting you to use your player knowledge here. Yeah. They did, and it pulled me out of the game experience really hard. Um, so I don't know if that's a retraction or not. Uh, no, I don't think it really is. I think it's just a criticism on an otherwise it's, good experience. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but what I want to see more of is the one element that I truly loved, which was parallel stories. Because, hmm. um, you know, I, I've written about a nonlinear story before, and one of the six forms of nonlinear story is parallel story. Mm-hmm. And I want to see more parallel story where if you get stuck, especially in something that is as hardwired and on a rail as adventure games, Mm -hmm. uh, where when you get stuck, you can actually just flip over to the other story for a while. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it bottlenecks a little bit, and you have to wait and then finish the other story before you can do all that. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, It gives you a break, and it gives you sort of a different pace and a different setting and a different character and different all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, kudos to... um, Tim Schafer and his crew over at Double Fine for doing something extremely innovative, I thought. Mm. Um, I think we should see more of that kind of thing. Mm. Um, but uh, as far as the story went, not his best work. So, there you go. Fair enough. Yeah, I know it's hard to mosh with me on that one because uh, <laughs> you haven't played it. But yeah. yeah. Anywho. Um, How about you? What have you been playing? I'm trying to think. Um, again, the answer is kind of not a lot because I've been so... Are you still sitting on The Witcher? I am still sitting on The Witcher. Dude. Yeah. yeah I now, I'm saying that as someone who hasn't actually played it. Um, <laughs> and yet it's like, you have The Witcher and you haven't played it. I know. It. That's the thing. I'm sitting here going, okay, I've got I've got like $24 left of my... You remember when I took my big stack of games mm-hmm. in and I, and I got 50 bucks? Yeah. I got like $24 left. And that, that'll buy half of The Witcher. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> not even including tax. But right. uh, you've got all of The Witcher. Yeah. So... You have no excuse, man. <laughs> the, the problem is I just haven't had like that nice window of, like, I've got four to six hours free that I can just sit down and get immersed for a while. Um, that's not one of those games I want to just pop on for 30 minutes because I know it's going to be a mistake. Oh, well, that's a good point. <laughs> um, and that's basically all I have lately is these little 30 to one hour windows of free time. Um, so maybe over the weekend. We'll see. Okay. Well, the other game I've been playing is Coup, mm-hmm. um, and I won't talk about that one either because we're going to talk about mobiles mm-hmm. later. Well, and as you just said, that's not a real game. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, not only is it a card game mm-hmm. that 
is a tabletop game mm-hmm. that then got translated very faithfully over into a video game, mm-hmm. but it still doesn't qualify mm-hmm. as a button mosh game because mm-hmm. there are no buttons in either format. Yes. Okay. I understand. <laughs> but um, I guess I will mention briefly that I did uh, give Heroes of the Storm a quick try. Oh, um, how was that? It, it is, I've never played any MOBAs before, um, except to say that I play... And like, you still haven't. Yeah, I guess not. Uh, <laughs> according to a lot of people. Um, but I did play like the original Defense of the Ancients on... Well, I guess... I don't know if Warcraft 3 is the first one I do, because I think it was Starcraft, people say. was yeah. the original, original Dota. But I played the Warcraft 3 Dota, which is the Dota that eventually led to the creation of League of Legends, and then, you know, Dota... Um, aptly named, um, and then of course uh, now Heroes of the Storm is kind of coming full circle. Some a Blizzard game that spawned the mod has now come full circle and become a game unto itself. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, you're talking about people who really like being trolled in games, so just tell them they're idiots and they don't know what they're talking about. They can <laughs> they can dig it. Yeah, they'll eat it right up. Um, I haven't played much of it. I've played a few rounds, um, and so far my character of choice has been uh, Jim Rayner. Um, he's actually the character that you play in the tutorial levels, um, and so I kind of got a feel for him and just decided to keep that's going That's the Space Marine, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, and so he's uh, he's one of the characters, like, they actually list the easiness to play, um, and he's listed as easy versus medium or hard. Uh-huh. Um, so maybe I'm just a noob because I'm playing the easy character, but I think he works quite nicely. Noob. Well, I'm a noob, so, yeah. Yeah, well. Uh-oh. Is it actually <laughs> still in beta, or is it... It's, it's out now, yeah. Okay. Um... Speaking of still in beta, that's a very good podcast by some friends of ours. You should check it out. That's true. Phil's on that. Yeah, he is. Um, quite often. So, uh, But without getting sidetracked too much. Um, it's cool. I'm enjoying it. Um, what, what's nice is that uh, I was always intimidated from getting into the other MOBAs because there's such a steep learning curve mm-hmm. and because um, I just don't like dealing with people, uh, people on chat. Um, so... And here, as far as I'm aware, the only way you can communicate is with text chat. And they actually give you a prompt at the beginning of the game saying, you're currently in your team chat. Click here if you want to turn it off. That's in Vogue right now. And I turned off the team chat. And so you can still have the cues. Like, people can sort of, like, put a marker on the map and say, we should retreat here. We should attack this or we should do this thing. Um, And so you can still kind of communicate and coordinate that way. But for the most part, you're sort of free to just play the game and not get harassed so i like not getting harassed on the internet nice. I'm, I'm with you on that one <laughs> yeah if, if i wanted to play with 10 year olds who you know swear a lot then i'd go like hang out with my cousins mm. or something or play call of duty yeah there you go Ooh, shots fired ow no Ooh, pun intended yeah. <laughs> anyway uh but yeah i think that's a uh, i think that's a pretty good button mosh let's move on to um shall we say table talk sounds good <laughs> Time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. The big game that I've been playing from my stack of games that I uh, recently traded up on Craigslist for uh, was actually one that I purchased new using the money that I got from trading the large stack of games on Craigslist. And that was Shadows of Camelot. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a game that I have known and loved for, gosh, it's been 12 years, 15. I don't want to, I don't even want to do the math. Mm-hmm. Um, but the cool thing about it is Merlin's Company is the expansion to it, which came out mm, maybe four or five years ago, but I had never played that one before. So I finally, finally, finally grabbed a copy for myself, and we broke it out, and we played the eight-player game. Now, the basic game, Shadows of Camelot, can actually be played with seven players. Uh, it's a cooperative game, and the way that it fundamentally works is there's progression of evil that has to happen, bad stuff, in other words. Mm-hmm. There may or may not be a traitor, um, and in the eight-player version, there may or may not be two traders, which mm. is really interesting. But there's guaranteed to be at least one. Mm. So what happens is you throw down the game, and there's all these different quests and boards. And I love a board game that has more than one board. Just something mm. about that just compels me. I don't know why. <laughs> and you've got all your different figures, and, and they're really well sculpted. And you decide that you're going to travel to go uh, to the Lady of the Lake and get Excalibur. Or maybe you're going to go fight the Black Knight. Or maybe you're going to stick around Camelot and fight off uh, Saxons and Picts. And maybe you're going to uh, try to fight the the siege engines that are at your doorstep. Now, while you're going questing while there's uh, siege engines on your doorstep, I don't know. (laughs) Ask Arthur. Um, actually, it, I played Arthur. It, it, was, it was a very different time back then. If you were under siege, it was kind of just common understanding that a few people can go in and out. You just sort of you know wave as you go by. True, and... true. You throw some peasants at it. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the cool thing about it is um, if, you, if you don't manage your time and your cards well and your battle well, 
uh, it's going to catch up to you. You will lose. So there's kind of a built-in time limit with a game, and I like I like that. Um, then there's also a strategy element where you've got to work together, and I like that. And then there's the trader element, and I like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it reminds me kind of of Dead... Uh, what is it? Dead Winter? Dead, uh, Dead of Winter, yeah. yeah Dead of one. Winter, the zombie one mm-hmm. that, that was recently um, put out. And, it, you know, I like games like that. I've, I've always always kind of liked them. So, um, anyway, I, I was really excited and really happy to do it. it. It ups the difficulty level a little bit with the Merlin expansion because uh, every time you travel to a new quest, you now have to draw a card, and you're looking for those nothing happens cards because everything <laughs> else that happens is bad. Right. right. Um, except for like if Merlin follows you, mm-hmm. but if he follows you, you get a little bonus, mm-hmm. uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, but that said, if you've never tried Shadows of Camelot, if you've never tried the Merlin expansion on Shadows of Camelot, give it a try. Pull that one off the shelf, or go down to your local game store and grab a copy because uh, it's pretty awesome. I personally think that it's one of those games that would be fantastic as a conversion to the mobile space, which, as we know, is not a real button mosh game. Um, yes. So, <laughs> uh, so I petitioned for that, Days of Wonder, uh, much like you have uh, put Memoir 44 online and Small World 2 online, mm-hmm. uh, you should also put... Oh, yeah, same company. Yeah, yeah. totally. Uh, and, and even, like, uh, what's it called, a like gang of... Uh, Gang of Fire or something like Gang of Four. It's like a dragon thing. Oh, okay. Anyway, um, I haven't actually played that one, but uh, Ticket to Ride. That that's the other one. The, oh yeah, the big one. That that one's on Mobile Space too. So mm-hmm. long overdue, I say. Mm-hmm. Long overdue. I'm shaking my fist right now <laughs> at the uh, at the microphone, mm-hmm. uh, and and hopefully uh, you guys at Days of Wonder, who are faithful listeners <laughs> to the Backward Compatible podcast will will immediately go we're such fools why didn't we do this <laughs> why and, have we not done this um, you know call up uh, doc and kruger for consultation so there we go there you go um yeah i guess i do have a little bit of a table talk i recently played uh a full game i've actually i've played like a half a game before with you um but i've played a full game of um the arabian nights or tales from the arabian oh yeah nights. tales of the arabian Nights. sure um and you know really cool game um it was Interesting because we had a full table and we actually had someone who was in charge of being the narrator. So basically, he would handle the book, right? Um, so he would just tell him what you needed, and he'd flip to it, and then he'd read it, and then uh, it just made the game go a lot quicker. It's less awkward enough to like pass the book around, and everyone has to know how to look everything up. And mm-hmm. um, so that made it go nice and smooth. Um, uh, actually, I think for the first time, I saw my first. Um, repeated uh, thing where you had the same story come up twice in the same game so that was interesting Um, but overall I'm just impressed again by the massive scope of that game and how much content there is in it Um, if if you've ever seen the book it's almost like a textbook as far as thickness goes and of course it's probably a heavier stock paper but um, yes let's blame it on that yes but it's it's still a very large thing so it's it's a really you know maybe another game that would be uh, ripe for a um an app adaptation mm-hmm. uh app adaptation ad adaptation there you go ad adaptation you making fun of me <laughs> i don't know maybe oh, okay I, I just like the pun of ad adaptation <laughs> um but uh but in all seriousness, um, oh, man, that one ranks right up there with Bracken Kraken. I don't know. <laughs> Although I wonder too if it would be, if it would kind of lose some of the mystique if you don't have the giant book that you're looking stuff up in, because if it's just kind of like feeding you the story that's generated by all the stuff, um, one to make it quicker and to make it easier. But on the other hand, um, you wouldn't have like kind of the same thing if like having this hefty giant book full of like these are all the possibilities. You know? True, I'll never play all of these, and that's awesome. You know? Well, you know there is nothing like that game out there. It is it is seriously a one of a kind game. If you ever have a chance to play Tales of the Arabian Nights, do it because it blends that sort of storytelling um, element, mm-hmm. if you will, of a choose your own adventure. Mm-hmm. To that board game, especially if you're an explorer like mm-hmm. me, I love exploration games. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what will I find around the next corner? Making yeah. the decisions, that kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. But what's interesting is, I recently acquired a copy of the original, um, and it's kind of the blue box. So if you get on eBay for about fifty bucks, you can find the original one from 1983ish. I want to say, mm-hmm. and it's actually a much shorter book. It's very very much simplified but it has a lot more rules in it like mm-hmm. caravans and establishing trade routes and uh, things like that that are stripped out later in the in the reboot mm-hmm. that was done by Z-Man mm-hmm. 
So um, they're, they're honestly almost not even the same game. In fact, the original one encourages you to uh, make up your story. And that if you can't think of anything, that's when you read them from the top. Oh, interesting. Uh, which is a completely different approach yeah, to yeah. the, uh, you know, thousand and mm. one-ish stories mm-hmm. that um, they added. I did start to notice for the first time, too, that in a way, once you start playing the game a few times and start learning some of its tendencies, you can kind of um, try to start gaming the system a little bit, where you're trying to, uh, you know, go for one of your win conditions or something like that, or you know, oh, this is a good skill to take because it comes up a lot, or whatever the case might be. Um, but I would really recommend, especially the first time, if not any time you play it, um, just, you know, sort of go along with the flow, play the game to enjoy the story and to enjoy that exploration, don't really play to win. Because if you play to win, you might find yourself very disappointed in kind of uh, what feels like randomness or a degree of unfairness or unpredictability. Um, And, you know, I I think that kind of fits the the Arabian Nights, you know. Oh, I agree. It's um, not meant to be balanced. Yeah. In fact, I I read... A, an interview mm. and they said how did you balance this and the answer was we didn't, we didn't. <laughs> which was kind of interesting yeah. so uh, which I think is almost the exact same quote that uh, Rob Davio made whenever he was asked about risk legacy mm-hmm. um, of how did you know how have you balanced that and the answer was I didn't mm-hmm. uh, which is fantastic yeah. I'm still waiting for uh, for the sequel which is rumored on board game geek to exist and be played um, I can neither confirm nor deny that I was a part of the beta test of that because mm-hmm. um, if I had been, I would be under a non-disclosure, gotcha, uh, and therefore would not be able to discuss it mm-hmm. in the podcast. Gotcha. Uh, however, uh, I'm really interested in uh, it maybe someday coming out mm-hmm. if it was ever theoretically announced, right? Which we don't know for sure. Well, I mean, it, it exists on Board Game Geek as a page. There you go. And there's discussion there. Mm-hmm. And there was a few podcasts he talked about it in. Okay. Uh, which is really good stuff, actually. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Rob Davio, cool guy. So, I guess we'll go ahead and uh, premiere uh, a new segment that we've come up with this week, which is... Uh, let's Watch, Let's Play. Now it's time for Let's Watch, Let's Plays. The part of our show about games, about shows about games. We'll have to figure out the cadence and how to sort of say that because I'm thinking of it as like let's watch let's play so like let's watch let's play right um, as opposed to let's, let's watch, watch comma, let's play let's play well that's the that's the double pun there mm, you I see it. that I think is the intention mm. behind that title uh, gotcha. of the genius who, who created that particular one mm. I want to know who that is yeah I don't know I think it, maybe it was Arwen yeah it, it must have been the same <laughs> genius who came up with uh, button mosh mm. um no, actually, that was a different genius. Yeah, I know it was. Okay. Yeah, but you know, I was I was <laughs> trying to maybe confuse the issue. Okay. I don't want to take credit for uh, uh, just the things I did. That would be selfish. <laughs> so you're trying to take possibly credit for the things you didn't do by confusing who did what. Well, now you got me confused. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about let's plays. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> uh, I know that, uh, you, Doc, play a lot more, le- or play, uh, play a lot more Let's Watches. I have a Mickey Mouse watch. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about watches, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. Speaking of watches, the Apple Watch is, Yeah, uh, it's, it's classic. Um, it's from the 1970s, mm-hmm. and it's numbered. Mm-hmm. And, oh. It's got those little arms that go around. Yeah, yeah, it really yeah. does. So, and, yeah, uh, it's, it's right over there on the table, actually. Very nice. Yeah. Um, but you watch a lot more Let's Plays than I, I do, do, actually, yeah. Um, mainly my the extent of my Let's Playing, not that I haven't seen others, just that I haven't really cared enough to follow uh, more than the Game Grumps. And even then, I don't really follow them as regularly as some might. I sort of pop on for a few episodes of key series and then, you know, go away for a while. And sure, yeah. And, um, so, I mean, you know, everyone... Uh, there's no one way to play a game. There's no one way to watch Let's Plays. That's right. So, um, and, and I guess we should clarify, we're using the broadest possible definition of Let's Plays. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's anybody on the internet who talks about uh, a, a gaming in a video format. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yes. That would well, include like I, I the Let's that, Builds. and, and That, that would probably, things. it does probably have to include, though, the playing of a game. So they're not just reviewing a game. Well, that's they're, a good point. They're playing. Yeah, I suppose that's true. So that, that's that's true. It would it would require them to have actually played in some fashion mm. uh, a game. Otherwise, it's just another podcast. Mm-hmm. And poof, yeah. Nobody listens to those. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so we just had this moment of extreme irony when we realized just how few listens we actually have. So. <laughs> we, we we appreciate you guys. Yes, thank uh, you. Shout out to Trey right now because I know you're listening. Good guy, man. <laughs> yep. appreciate you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, in all seriousness, um, yeah, I think that one of the most interesting let's plays that 
has emerged on the scene in the last few weeks is Titan's Titan, Grave. Titan's Grave, yeah. Titan's Grave, which is basically, as I understand it, and Chris, you know more about this mm-hmm. than I do, it's the spinoff to Tabletop, right. Will Wheaton's... Mm-hmm. Um, vi- what it, what, it, what it, would you call that a, a, a let's play as well? I sure. Mean, by by the definition we've adopted. Okay, excellent, so. fantastic. <laughs> um, it's, it's a it's a video let's play mm-hmm. of board games mm-hmm. mostly. Although he has done RPGs in the past. Yes. I know he's done Dread and, and mm-hmm. various other systems. So mm-hmm. uh, he had Fate once, didn't he? Did he do Fate? Uh, I don't know if he did Fate. Oh, um, okay. What what he's done um, when they were trying to do Tabletop Season Three, um, they decided to crowdfund it. Um, and part of the crowdfunding campaign said that if we can hit a million dollars of crowdfunding, um, which was above and beyond their minimum goal for making the season. I would imagine, yes. Um, like, well above and beyond. Um, which they did hit. Um, they said that they would make an RPG spinoff of Tabletop, an RPG-dedicated show. And so I was very intrigued by this because some of my favorite episodes on Tabletop were the ones where they played um, role-playing games. They did a, a Fiasco. Um, Fiasco is what I was thinking of. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then they also did Dread, and they did the Dragon Age RPG, the tabletop. Right. RPG. Right. The generic um, one or the the the, the, the actual level. Dragon Age. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which actually, interestingly enough, that was GM'd by, if not the designer, one of the designers. Of the oh game. wow, that's neat. So that was pretty cool. I haven't actually watched those episodes. So. Oh, you should go back. Yeah. And watch I, there, there's some tabletop I haven't seen. Mm-hmm. It's uh, there's actually quite a bit I haven't seen either because. Again, like with the Game Grumps, I, I watch the ones I'm interested in and skip all the others. It's so. like the top shelf guacamole. You don't want to order it every time you <laughs> go into the fancy Mexican restaurant um, because then it loses its um, sabor. You, know? <laughs> you, you want to you want to do it every third time, and then mm-hmm. it's like you need to be reminded of what's bad before you go back to what's good. Well, it's not about what's bad; it's about what's best. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, fair enough. Or so, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, the, so the, 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 sad, they... the sad existence of someone who doesn't get good and best, they get bad and best. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, I assume that I assume they made their million goal. They, they did make their okay, million goal. That was my and understanding. So, uh, they went on to make this show, and for the longest time, there were no details on it. They hadn't um, said like what system they're going to be using, what the story was going to be, and then eventually they said they'd picked out a system, um, which is actually the the first thing they said was that they were developing a system for the show. Um, what it turned out to be was actually the generic version of the system that was the basis of Dragon Age, mm-hmm. um, which I believe was also um, used for the Song of Ice and Fire RPG. Um, that makes sense. Uh, because I think that was from the same people. I could be wrong about that. Yeah, that's one of the most <laughs> gorgeous books that has ever come out in RPG land. Mm. It, the, the first 18 pages of that are a history mm-hmm. of fantasy. Mm. And in fact, I used that those 18 pages for my lecture history of fantasy that I used to give whenever I taught the history and development of role-playing games over at UT Dallas. So Nice. Uh, yeah, that, that was a lifesaver for me because that content and research was all done and cited, and all I had to do was cite the one source, and all the rest was taken care of. There you go. And pro tip. Pro tip. Uh, so anyway, fun fact, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, which of course was the show that Will Wheaton appeared on as uh, the... Uh, undefagable Wesley Crusher, mm-hmm. right? Uh, was the first TV show ever to spend w- over a million dollars per episode. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Hmm. I just found that interesting because of the million dollars, but that was my way of getting us back on topic, yeah. which is to say... Uh, that, so, getting back on topic with another segue. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, in any case... Um, I think the second episode came out this week at the time of recording. Um, I've not watched it yet, um, just because I haven't had the time. <laughs> we keep coming back to the issue of time there. But it's a, it's a neat show. What they do yeah, is they, they take a session of a role-playing game, um, and they do, it's got really good post-production work in the sense that it's well-edited. Um, so often what you have with tabletop role-playing shows is just kind of like, here, we're going to give you the two to three hours of us playing, which there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But you get a lot of the pauses, you get a lot of the, um, let me take a look at my sheet and see what I need to roll. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I rolled a 20, and that adds to my skill of 14, so I rolled a 34. Oh, don't forget the modifier for this. How much damage is that? Oh, it's that. that All the stuff you don't really care about in a role-playing game. And the, the system is a lot... The system's a lot quicker um, than you know your typical like D and D or Pathfinder or whatever as far as resolving conflicts. Um, but they'll even go through and they'll you can tell in the editing cut out the pauses between things. Yeah. Um, and they they keep it nice and quick. So even the combat, which you know in the first episode I think there's maybe 
five or ten minutes of the full forty minute episode was combat. Yeah. Um, but it went it went quickly enough that they kept it exciting. They added special effects and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, yeah, it's been it's been a pretty interesting show. It actually, I, I mentioned too that it reminded me of. Um, because I watched the first episode after I edited the first episode of uh, Roll With It, and we're doing kind of similar things in a lot of ways. So it's With the sound effects and mm-hmm. whatnot, yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course, they're doing it visually, so they've, they've got art, concept mm-hmm. art, things like that, which, as I understand it, at least part of it is fan-sourced, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I forget if it was fan-sourced or if it was more like their friends in the industry from all over the place have contributed. Well, they're fans, right? Yeah, I suppose. Okay. Friends um, and fans, it's not mutually exclusive. <laughs> so. But it, what what I found interesting was kind of the almost manifesto that was in episode zero, and, and actually kind of repeated in brief at the beginning of episode one, which was Will Wheaton's personal philosophy on role play. Yes. And I found that to be really interesting because um, he and I agree a lot on this. Um you know, I, I would cite myself if it wasn't completely presumptuous uh, and actually uh, talk about what I wrote in Dungeons and Dragons and Philosophy, mm-hmm. the, the chapter book, which I contributed a chapter to, mm-hmm. in which I, I wrote that uh, no fight should go on longer than 40 minutes. And that's mm-hmm. an epic boss fight. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I won't do that because, like I said, that would be presumptuous. <laughs> um, so please edit that out. Um, if it still remains in the podcast, then that that's your fault, Chris. Um, but then so there's know. just going to be like this giant like leap in train of thought. That's well, that's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is this also in, brings that, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, th- this also brings up a, a really good point, which mm-hmm. is that uh, you know tabletop and also um, Titan's Grave mm-hmm. has something that we don't have, and that's called a budget. Yes, um, we have Chris. <laughs> mm-hmm. So thank you, Chris. Yay. We love you and. Um, this show would not exist without all the extra work that you do mm. to make it happen. Well, it might it might exist just in a different form. So, well, that's true. You probably just slap it together and <laughs> yeah. post it, right? <laughs> With the are you are we ready to record? I, are we uh, have we put? Okay, it, did you hit it? Okay, we hit it. Which, which you know we do at the beginning of every show. Yes, um, and normally gets cut out. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, so. Um, but uh, no, I, I will take. Uh, I was actually saying all that for a purpose, mm-hmm. not just to be funny. But um, actually, it was to say this that he he said one thing in his manifesto, which was uh, really compelling to me, which is that every person at the table sees it in their mind in a different way. Right. Um, and I was totally on board with that. And then I watched episode one, and mm-hmm. some of the art came up, and there was actually a fizz rep moment mm-hmm. where there was kind of a grid superimposed. Mm-hmm. And this was all done in post, so there's no way mm-hmm. that I understand it that, that the players would have seen this or mm-hmm. been influenced by it. But we, the viewers, definitely did see it and were influenced by it. And it, it showed... Um, kind of the caravan that was being attacked and where the players stood and where the baddies all were and which one was being eliminated. And the irony at that point was that um, it kind of took away, at least for me, Mm -hmm. from that ability to imagine it the way I wanted to. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it kind of reminds me of the old theater exercise, which is imagine yourself as a tree Mm -hmm. and then... Uh, you have them, the people close their eyes and they imagine themselves as a tree and they're a beautiful tree and mm-hmm. all of that. And then, you know, your actors can be become trees. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you show them a picture of a tree and they say, become this tree, become this tree it's right. not as strong of an exercise. And this is the reason why a chair can be a better tree than a paper mache tree. Mm-hmm. Because the paper mache tree looks like a really crappy <laughs> set piece. Yes. Whereas the chair is obviously not a tree mm-hmm. and all of us imagine and see the beautiful oak. Mm-hmm. That is there with the tree. You know. And this is why, um, it, you know, kindergarten plays can actually be better than Broadway plays mm-hmm. if done right. Yeah. <laughs> Which <laughs> they aren't. Which they aren't. And, and no. Um, but I will say on that same note, though, um, I actually do like the illustrations they have because... They are pretty. Um, they are very... They're very well done. But also because, it, 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 to me, it strikes me the kind of the same way as when you buy a role-playing book with a built-in setting. Um, or you buy a, a module for a role-playing system, it's going to have a lot of illustrations in it um, that help to give you kind of a sense of what the world might look like. You know, Dungeons & Dragons even even does this. Oh, sure. Um, and so, you know, different people, different artists will contribute and have, like, you know, slightly different styles and all this different stuff. But I liked it because it kind of gives you a sense 
for a few moments here and there of what the world generally looks like, and then you still have to fill in the blanks on everything else. Um, so I don't necessarily mind that they show, you know, the occasional um, flash of action here and there, because, you know, I like the idea, too, that um, these players design their characters to, you know, behave and possibly look a certain way, and then the illustrator sort of took that after the fact and said... Um, here's what we got. Yeah. So, yeah. I won't be watching it with my um, 11 month old in the room, though, mm-hmm. since there is beheadings and blood mm-hmm. in some of those videos. And a bit of language. So, which is yeah. kind of ironic mm-hmm. when you consider that it really could have just been an easy PG or PG 13 thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but as soon as you show that metaphor, mm-hmm. speak, or uh, visual, mm-hmm. metaphorically in a video game space, it would become an M rating. Yeah. Which we talked about mm-hmm. and watching it. So. And unless there's one in the description, I didn't notice any sort of um, viewer discretion warning on the video. So, And I'm not going to slam them for that because, you know, the internet, there's no expectation of ranking. No, they're not bound by the ESRB yeah. or anything. No, no, not at all. But um, just if, in case you are wondering, if you're a fan of tabletop and you want to watch this with your kids, maybe check on it first before you watch it with your children. There you go. Um, so I'll just throw that out there. Yeah. Of course, you should probably, you know, not be watching this show with your kids either. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Especially when Jim's on because he swears more than <laughs> Not that often. He's the colorful but... one. <laughs> he is. Um, so I guess we're going to transition into our uh, main topic of discussion for the evening, which was going to be about um, kind of instead of the mobile minute this time, we've got the mobile half hour, hour, I don't know what it is, the, the mobile chunk. <laughs> I feel like it needs to start with an M. Mm. The, the mobile meaty... The mobile moment? I mean, because the, the, mobile... the mobile... Oh, now I can't say it. The mobile meaty topic. There we go. Maybe. Yeah. No. Yeah, when you say maybe, I always know you don't like it. That's fine. These yeah. are how design meetings go yes. at Doc and Kruger. Uh, you know, Doc says something and, and Kruger says, mm, maybe. maybe. Or it's not bad. Or yeah, and, then, and then I'm like, oh, okay. okay. Yeah, let me rethink that. <laughs> and the worst part is he's usually right. Mm. But, well, I will, I will say that when I say that, because sometimes if, it, if I just think it's a terrible idea, period, I'll probably say so. But I don't think many ideas are terrible. That's it's true. more that I find something good in them and then we can kind of take that, the, the core idea behind it and turn it into something else possibly. So you like to rip the guts out of my idea yes. and then stuff it into haggis. Yeah. Cool! I did that. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, the truth is, I, I think we're a pretty darn good team actually. I'd agree. I'd agree. Yeah, so, uh, what were we talking about? <laughs> oh yeah, mobile the, games. The, the, <laughs> the, the mobile M something, the alliterative uh, title for the rest of the episode. Yeah, that, so mobile meat. Mobile meat. We can roll with that. No. <laughs> mm, maybe. <laughs> there you go. Um, I want to talk about Fallout. Okay. I want to talk about Fallout Shelter. Mm. Um, E3 has uh, been going on this week at the time of recording. And so lots of big announcements. It was like, uh, I think, Sunday night that they announced lots of uh, Fallout stuff. Fallout 4 was officially official, mm. um, that kind of a thing. And then they said, oh, yeah, we've got this thing called Fallout Shelter. And it's available right now. Mm. And they pushed the button, and there it was. Yeah. Um, so we all immediately went and downloaded it for our iOS devices. And uh, I think it's on Android, too, isn't it? Uh, probably. Yeah. And um, I have to say, some people have gone... Mm, no, it's the same. But what I I see it for what it is, you know. Um, I, I've got some experience in transmedia, and, and so obviously what it is is an attempt to keep our minds in the Fallout game world space between now and November. Between now and November, right. and I think this is a very successful way to do it mm. because what you've got is, um, in my opinion, a very faithful um, to the. And I don't want to say concept art because that could be misleading, mm-hmm. but actually the the training videos that actually appear within game, mm-hmm. the in other words, the in game animations themselves, the, the Pip Boy, uh, yeah, style. Pip Boy himself, yeah, um, and actually he's called Vault Boy technically. Mm-hmm. Uh, the oh, Pip right, Boy right. is the thing you wear on your right, that's on your arm, right, right. Uh, but that's a common mistake. So. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I, as I looked at, because I looked this up earlier, I wanted to find out who the actual artist who'd done that. His name is Leonard Boyarski, mm. was the guy who came up with the original Vault Boy. Mm. Uh, and it actually has a disambiguation between Vault Boy and Pip Boy, which is really, really <laughs> kind of funny. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the first Vault Boy concept art was actually based on, um, what's his name, like Uncle Moneybags from the Monopoly series? It doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Which is really interesting. that it, The whole style then was informed by that mm-hmm. and came from it. Well, so some people are saying, mm, no, Fallout uh, Shelter doesn't doesn't feel like it belongs in the the universe. Mm. I I disagree. I think it it belongs within the meta mm. of the propaganda mm-hmm. of 
the Fallout universe. Right. All the the videos that they show in universe. Yes. Um, of like, oh, come to the vault and all this different stuff, and you know, even the um, the uh, when you when you're looking at the hip boy, which of course is vault tech technology. Right. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, it's got that art style in there, but you're like it you does. Know, it, that that art style is very familiar to me when we just played Fallout because you know all the different um, special abilities have little illustrations that look like you know they're usually comedic mm-hmm. of um, like these very sort of cutesy like fifties. Um, cartoons in like these very like dismembered sort yeah. of. You know. Well, it's been in every Fallout game, even the yeah. bad one, which was Fallout Brotherhood. Mm. Not to be confused with Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, which mm. I liked. I that was Fallout Tactics. Okay, um, but Fallout Brotherhood was actually the top-down PlayStation Two release that nobody knows and nobody remembers, and it was garbage because you could get shot from off screen without being able to target the guy off screen because it was a top down shooter oh, lovely. it was a reskin of a completely different engine oh. but I don't want to talk about it because it <laughs> sucks um, but no I've actually been having a lot of fun with it but I have to tell my story which is how I accidentally became a cult leader mm. uh, so I'm, I'm playing along so the first day that I'm playing and uh, what I Acquired through um, different channels because you can uh, unlock missions and, and there's little challenges and things like that. And then you get rewards and a lunchbox opens up and cards come out of the lunchbox and the cards represent weapons and uh, armor and different clothing pieces and uh, stim packs and right away and all these cool things. And I got this priest's outfit. And the priest's outfit has a huge buff for charisma because, of course, every little person in there, every vault boy and girl Mm -hmm. within there has their own stats which is cool Mm -hmm. because you can assign them to rooms and rooms like water purification or electrical or the quarters or uh the restaurant i think i see where this is going they all have (laughs) different um Different. well they they have different stat relations right um, so it, it's using the same special system. Yeah, it uses the same special um, system. And so, for example, I think it was um, in the uh, power generator room, um, someone with a good strength stat is best in there because it's a the room... Bingo. It, yeah, it's not actually strength, strength it's intelligence for, mm-hmm. for the power generator. Oh, okay. And it's yeah. perception for mm-hmm. the water uh, generator, you know, et cetera. Right. But, but, yeah, you're exactly right. You're, mm-hmm. you're, you're totally onto it. And you actually send people back out into the wasteland because this is taking place... Um, in the Fallout universe, it's actually taking place post, mm-hmm. which is interesting. So there's kind of this interesting little thing where there's like three people standing outside of one that apparently never got used or never got built. Mm. And then they go in and they start using the technology and, and using the prefab kits to create the... Which is kind mm. of interesting. Interesting, because when you put it that way, that is it, it seems like it's a different spin on what it was pitched as, as right. far as I could tell. Because what it was pitched as is you're an administrator, you're the overseer. You are the overseer. Well, yeah, they do call you the overseer, but you're the overseer of a vault tech vault. Right. And so... Well, it is I, a vault tech vault. It is. But my understanding going into it, what I was kind of imagining when I heard the announcement, because I was really intrigued, I went mm-hmm. and downloaded it right away, was that you were the overseer of a vault, which meant that your 500 people have been put in there and sealed, and it's not reopening until the beginning of the next Fallout game. Um, and basically what you have to do is take this population of 500 and manage them. Um, right. What this has turned into is this weird thing where, for some reason, you can just like open the vault door willy-nilly to let in you know this, this line That's of right, people actually. coming in. And, and not only that, yeah. but raiders will come and actually bash in your door, which you need to upgrade. Mm. Um, and then you'll have to repair the door and, and things like that. So, no, I think it has more... Like, like I said, it has more... Of a reflection of the propaganda, mm-hmm. which is, if you're in a vault, you will survive. It mm-hmm. won't be that bad. It's the duck and cover mentality from mm-hmm. the 50s, right? right? It's, Th- that desk will totally save you. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's if you see the explosions, duck and cover. Mm-hmm. And that's what this, the whole thing, the, the since the very beginning has been, the tone of Fallout has been, mm-hmm. is that mentality. And this game, I think, does very, very good job of that. Because you can send send a wanderer out into the to the wastes and then he'll go get stuff and bring it back and, mm-hmm. and it's cool anyway to get back to my story though for, for what happened to me uh, one of the cool things that I got was the priest's outfit mm-hmm. which had this massive and I mean huge charisma buff mm-hmm. uh, as you might expect from a religious figure within your community uh, what I didn't understand was that this was actually a really rare drop. Mm. 
And so I have a little priest who's walking around. And he kind of looks like a bishop or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, you know, I've got this little vault boy who is my religious leader. Mm-hmm. And he, he mans the radio. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, he does all these other things. But then what I realized was the best way to get your population up is actually to breed humans. Mm-hmm. And so you can actually put two of your little uh, vault boys together and your vault girl together mm-hmm. and, and into a quarters. You mm-hmm. sign them the quarters and wait. And they'll have a conversation. They'll fall in love. Mm-hmm. And then magic will happen. Yes. Uh, apparently. Apparently there is no marriage in the future because they're not monogamous in any way or shape or form. But <laughs> hey, you know, it's the it's the vaults. There are only so many people here. Yeah. Exactly. We're doing it for, for human civilization. Yes. Um, but w- the thing is that, that particular interaction is based on a charisma stat. Mm. So, so the priest has the... The priest had the highest. Yeah. And so, of course, yeah. every... What, basically, what <laughs> from a game standpoint, what I realized I needed to do was stick him, just assign him in the room, and start parading women through... <laughs> One at a time, one at a time, one at a time. He and within, didn't come in celibate, to be fair. He yeah, did not well, come in that's celibate. True. <laughs> uh, but you know, with, within five minutes, I basically had, had all the women in my Fallout shelter pregnant. And uh, you can put them back to work. So this was another kind of a moral quandary. Do I, you know, where do I put them? Do I put them in the, uh, you know, in the restaurant where they can work and, and, and that be less damaging? Do I put them in the storehouse when well, there might be some heavy lifting? Uh, what if that water is contaminated? I'm not sure I want them down there mm. uh, while they're pregnant. And then, uh, you know, finally by the time I got to the last stack of women, I'm just like, oh, no, just go down to the electrical. We need, we need somebody who's smart down there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I just had the women working. Well, the disadvantage to that is a pregnant woman uh, when an attack comes from rad roaches or from um, outside or something like that, they run. Mm. Um, even if they have a gun and even if they have armor, they will run. And, and so I had half my population just running uh, from danger. And, and this was even worse because I decided at this point that since I was running a cult um, that you know where the father was basically uh, married to all of the women that I might as well get rid of the men. And so I had sent them all out into the wasteland. So what I basically had was one um, priest with a shotgun <laughs> following raiders around inside of my mountain while the male population was out gathering supplies and the females were all pregnant and running around. <laughs> uh, in retrospect, I kind of wish I'd gotten a screen grab of that because <laughs> I, it would have made a great cover for our uh, podcast this week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, either way, um, that's my story. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've now found my true calling. Uh, so... You can start calling me Father Adam, and uh, when the apocalypse comes, uh, I will I will be the progenitor of the new race, who will be gluten intolerant and have a dairy um, processing issue. But right. hey, you know that's okay. Yeah, I don't think we're going to call you by that name after that story. So no, because <laughs> no. I was going to call them the Adamites. Mm. Lovely. No, <laughs> it's biblical. Yeah, I suppose it is. Okay. Um. So what other mobile games have you been playing, Chris? <laughs> We've both been playing Coop. Yes, we have been playing Coup, um, which uh, very interesting adaptation of the card game by the same name. Now we should probably spell that mm. uh, because C O U P. It's spelled, uh, yeah, it's spelled like. Well, no, actually, it's not. I was going to say it's spelled like the chicken thing, but but that's actually C O O P, isn't it? Yes, it is. Oh, okay, so never mind. So it is a it is a homonym, mm-hmm. uh, but not a homograph. Yes, I used to be an English teacher. Sixth grade. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I never did learn all those terms, but I can still write pretty well, I think. So I, yeah. I, I, I can write good. You write good. I write good. I, I've seen your writing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but uh, the adaptation, the app adaptation, I think it was actually kickstarted, but I never heard about it. Was it? Um, oh, I didn't know that. And that, that, I don't know for sure if that's true. I, that's just something somebody said on um, a review on the app store. So oh, okay. you can never know for sure if those are correct. But <laughs> Maybe the art was kickstarted. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> um, but that, that actually was something I was going to mention because I was struck immediately um, when I first see, started seeing ads for it, um, you know, through Facebook and stuff like that, um, that it had the name Koo, but it didn't look like Koo. And then I'm like, okay, so what is this? And so it's like, oh, no, it's based on the, you know, the hit card game, Koo. It's like, well, I like Koo, but this doesn't look like Koo. Um, and I think what happened is... Um, Maybe for a number of reasons, and I think one of them might actually be that they wanted to appeal to um, a more casual audience who would like kind of the more cartoony style. It looks a little bit, um, 
uh, more caricatured, um, a little bit maybe more appealing, you can say, versus the original art, which is very sort of like, you know, realistic, hard edge sci-fi sort of. Yeah, it's kind of dark mm-hmm. in, a, in a good way. Yeah. Dystopian, um, to and, use exactly the right term. Yes. Um, and I, I vastly prefer the original card style, which you can actually go and buy in the game. Um, it's a free-to-play game, and they've got a few things you can purchase. Um uh, including like you can pay two ninety nine to remove the ads, um, which I went ahead and did just because the ads got. Annoying. They're really irritating, actually. Yeah. That's the one thing that I will just stab them in the eye for verbally is those pop up ads because they they usually happen whenever a turn changes, mm. and so it's like it's your turn, but there's an ad. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the last thing I'm going to do is look at this ad. Yeah, seriously, mm-hmm. close. Yeah, jeez. Um, but all that matters is the impressions. So. Um, with that being said, I went ahead and bought the thing, and I kind of wish that there was also um, a, a UI overhaul you could purchase, so that it would look more um, like the the an art universe from the original game. Um, because, that might come. Yeah, it might come eventually. Um, because, like, you know, you look at the table, and it's got, like, this thing. It's like, um, coup, you know, overthrowing government since 1947. And actually, they gave, a, they gave a year, and I don't know if the Resistance now called the dystopian universe... Um, states a year that they're set in. I think they just say the distant future where mm-hmm. such and such. Um, but these guys, I think, said it was like in the year 2037, this stuff is happening. And all, so I, I don't know. I'd have to read up a little bit more on what their approach was to the adaptation. Interesting. Um, but it, it's one of those things where it's like oddly, like it's supposed to be the same game and yet it's not. And in fact, there is a slight mechanical difference, if I remember correctly, which is that um, there is no move to take foreign aid, um, which would get you two coins. So there's an income where you get one coin and that can't be blocked or challenged. Yeah. yeah. There's the duke who can tax and that can be blocked, but right. that takes three coins. Um, taking four and eight was something anyone could do, but the duke or somebody else could block it. But what about stealing? Stealing lets you get two coins if you're the captain. Yeah. Um, but, was it but that, that, but that, that way? But that could be blocked by other people. I oh, think that was true. that way. Um, but yeah, four and eight, I think, could be blocked by the Duke, maybe the Ambassador, I forget. Well, and of course, tax allows you to take three if you have the Duke, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's always been there. Yeah. So, um... That's interesting. I had forgotten that, but as soon as you say it, mm-hmm. it re- reminds me, because it's been... Gosh, it's been almost a year since you and I, um, played the original card game Coup, which you own. Yeah. Yeah, but it makes um, me want to break it out again, honestly. Yeah, it's a, re- it's a really cool game. Um, and I do think the app does a pretty good job of adapting it i would say that um you're losing some of the person reading and the bluffing um definitely elements um but it it, it still works in a different way in that it becomes now it doesn't make sense for them to bluff here you're thinking more about that than trying to read mm-hmm. someone um and technically there are like little chat things you can do and i think you can actually purchase some of these chat things that say yeah the first three pages are free mm-hmm. even though page two and three are actually a purchase but it's a purchase for zero dollars which mm-hmm. is really why? I don't know. Maybe it's to get you used to the idea of purchasing, Maybe. And the mechanics of purchasing or mm-hmm. something like that. But um, it, once again, it uses that same thing that Hearthstone uses mm-hmm. as, and, and that uh, you were just talking about a minute ago with Heroes of the Storm, mm-hmm. which is kind pre- of, preset comments. Yes, emotes, if you will. The one, Yeah, there you go. The one emote that I wish, wish, wish was in there and is not mm-hmm. is sorry. Mm-hmm. I really want there to be a sorry. But you're not supposed to be sorry in this game. Well, that's true. <laughs> uh, but, you know, half the time whenever I say it in Hearthstone, I don't mean it. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I'm it's, saying it's, it sarcastically. It's, yeah, sarcastically. So, sorry about that. Like, I just creamed you and... Sorry. <laughs> so, um, but not in real life. I'm, I'm genuine and sincere in all times whenever I say sorry. Yes. That said, there apparently is also the Reformation um, deck as well, which you can buy for a couple bucks. Mm-hmm. In the digital version, too, right? Um, yeah, I think what that is is just the alternate skins. So I think the expansion that just came out actually mm-hmm. has a bunch of alternative versions of what's already there. Um, oh, that's not the card game expansion that is also out? The card game expansion is out, um, which I did buy. I've not played yet. Mm-hmm. Um, what's it called? Uh, I think it is Reformation. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so they've got the alternative skins that came with it, but I believe that's just the card art swap in the app. I don't think you actually oh, really? have the expansion. So you don't have the factions or anything like that, the, the rule changes that happen? I don't believe so, okay. no. Because in the early versions of that, you were actually deciding whether or not you were Catholic or Protestant, which was really interesting. Mm. Um, and then later on, it's whether or not you're, I think it's like, loyal or resistance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, loyalist or resistance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Well, they're doing a whole lot of interesting things with that universe, aren't they? What, what's mm-hmm. the name of the other game that exists in that universe? Um, so, The Resistance is kind of like the the one that turned me onto the the series. If okay, you will, yeah, the universe, and that's the that's the same mechanics generally as what Avalon is. It uh, Avalon, I think, was it, uh, Avalon. I think they technically call it. If it's not in the same universe, they call it like you know based on the resistance. It's the same game as the resistance, mm-hmm. but with more roles, and it's based on Arthurian legend, right? Um, and actually, um, the newest newer expansions that came out for the resistance um, seem like they actually emulate um, a lot of the mechanics of the Brian Avalon, and then they also add some. Sure. Yeah. Um, so they've uh, really expanded upon the roles and the types of things that you can do in the resistance. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's cool. The resistance, um, they actually just kickstarted a game, which is, um, I think one night resistance, which is actually kind of based on, um, one night werewolf. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's given the resistance skin. Um, oh, okay. That makes sense. I think there's also like, um, coup like G fifty four or something, which is based on another game mechanically that's not being sent into the Resistance universe, and there's all sorts of stuff happening now. So they're doing um, a, a series of uh, Kickstartery things um, related to the Resistance universe. And that, ladies and gentlemen, or the dystopian is, universe as they call it now. That's how you run a game company by selling games that cost fifteen dollars a piece. It's by reskinning it and selling it three or four times to the same people. I suppose it hey, is. Hey, George Lucas did that for years. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's any other major games in that universe. Um, I, I think I think it did start with the Resistance, and that's why for a while they called it the Resistance Universe. But you were telling me that they're actually changing the name of yes, that, aren't they? Because they they didn't want it like this new game that just kickstarted, and I actually backed. Um, they didn't want it to be confused as an expansion of Resistance, mm-hmm. um, so they wanted to change the name of the universe so they could say it's the dystopian universe, not the Resistance universe. Um, so, in theory, people would be less confused. Now, actually, I like the Resistance universe better, because dystopian, to me, is more like a description. Yeah, it's a, it's than, an adjective. It's an adjective and not a noun, <laughs> you know? Um, and so, like, even if they called it, like, the dystopia universe, yeah. turned it into a noun, I think that would have worked better. But, yeah. Eh. <laughs> oh, well. It's their game. Well, you know, when you buy it, you can just cross off the end. There you go. Get your Sharpie just, out. Just scratch it out. Yeah, like, just... Why is the box damaged here? Because <laughs> it's pretty... an adjective. <laughs> <laughs> I can't have that. <laughs> See, you are a good writer. You know your parts of speech. Yes. I know some of them, at least. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so along those lines... Um, Another game that has had some interesting changes literally this week is uh, Hearthstone. Yes, Speaking Hearthstone, of Hearthstone. Which we mentioned on a previous Mobile Minute. Yeah, um, more than once, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Might have, yeah. Well, we, we play a lot of Hearthstone. Yes. So, um, you know, Hearthstone's an interesting game for me because I, I didn't get into it until it became mobile. And then I, I kind of played it out, I dropped it, and went almost, what, nine months without playing. And then it went to phones. Mm-hmm. And whenever it hit my phone, I picked it back up, which yeah. is sort of ironic because I don't actually play it on my phone. Mm. I still play it on my iPad. But it's had a lot of changes since then. It's had the yeah, adventure I think, modules. I think it's, also what that did, too, is that you have a lot of people who get into it for the first time because of phones. And so you get back into it in part to play with all your friends. And then by then you're just kind of rehooked. It's the gateway app. Yeah. Yeah, that's totally <laughs> it. Or the gateway device, I mean. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff going on in Hearthstone. Um, what's the what's the new mode that just yeah, released last week? Yeah, Tavern Brawl uh, just came out. Tavern Brawl. Um, and so uh, I played my first game of that today, the time of recording. Um, and it was um, two Blackrock Mountain bosses from that adventure. It's uh, Nefarian versus Ragnaros. Oh yeah. Um, and basically, one player is playing as Ragnaros, the other one's playing as Nefarian. Um, and you actually get their specialized decks, so you get all these cards you normally can't play with. So it's actually really cool. It's very different, different mechanically. And my understanding from what Blizzard has said is that each of the tavern brawls is going to change week to week, and each week's going to be a different set of rules. Yeah, by the time you're listening to this, that one will be gone, and it'll be a new thing. Yep. Um, so we can play a new game, which is called Let's Predict What the Next Tavern Brawl is going to be. Uh, Chris, go. I have no idea. <laughs> um, I mean, if I had to throw out a guess, and maybe it's one that doesn't happen next time, but maybe eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, something where perhaps you're playing as uh, the next Rimus bosses. Um, it kind of seems like a natural extension. Okay, yeah. Um, or maybe it's kind of like a, a three-way thing where it can be any one of those three, because those two are kind of like considered main bosses in a way. 
Um, the only main boss, quote unquote, in um, Curse from Dexramas was uh, Kel'Thuzad. Yeah. So maybe he gets thrown into the mix among those three or something. Um, they have said stuff about like you know building a deck with a certain number of rules or um, just like different mechanics are going to behave differently. Yeah, or yeah. Something. So I'm very curious to see what they do. Basically, it sounds like they can use this as their way to experiment with all sorts of different crazy um, mechanics. Which you're you got a little bit of that in the adventures. Mm-hmm. Um, or for instance, they give you pre-made decks for the class challenges, or you're facing up against um, you know these boss decks that are completely different um, from anything you would play against other players. Oh yeah, I like the ones that where like every card that you had was exactly the same, mm-hmm. and there was a one-two process for it where you had to play the card, and then in doing that, you like get I think it was get a beast, mm-hmm. you get a random beast. I think what one of them was was um, you got a hero ability that like summons. Um, a legendary character. Right. And then, so basically you just got this yeah, board full of legendaries. Too. And so I beat that one really easily, it turns out, because it's like, hey, look, give me enough legendaries and I'll just... Yeah, you know, <laughs> go so, figure, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, that one may have actually had a hidden agenda, which was, uh, oh, this game can be easy if I have legendaries. I just need to play more. Yeah. <laughs> I, need, I, need I need to, to buy, buy more packs. packs. <laughs> so I can forge more legendaries. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so speaking of buying more packs, uh, they also just recently released the uh, new Heroes. Um, All right. So it's the same class. The mechanics are totally the same, um, but they're switching the skin essentially. Oh, but there's an animation. Mm-hmm. Yes, there's which an animation. is totally worth ten bucks. So, <laughs> yeah. So Doc and I are in agreement here that the ten bucks for the heroes is a bit pricey. It's um, thirty for all three. It's thirty for all three. Yeah. Uh. Um, right now they have uh, Magni Bronzebeard, I believe, King of Iron Forge. Um, I'm forgetting her first name, but Windrunner, so I'm guessing it's, like, the sister or somebody of Sylvanas. Yeah. Um, and she's the hunter swap. Um, and then there's, uh... I never played Alliance, so I I don't remember. Yeah. And then, uh, I think it was, like, Alina or something, I want to say. That sounds right. Um, and then there's, um, oh, what's his name? Medivh. Is the mage swap, which actually, if there was one that I was tempted to get, it'd be Medivh, because one, I, I main mage right now in Hearthstone, and two, Medivh's just super cool, and as far as the lore goes. Yeah, lore-wise. You were saying he was one of the guys who originally he, opened yeah. the gate or he, something? He, he opened the Dark Portal, which like, <laughs> works in Azeroth, <laughs> Whoops. and then later uh, basically went back and tried to, like, he worked through um, Thrall and others in Warcraft 3 to help... Um, prevent the oncoming apocalypse of demon invasion. Yeah. Um, so, you know, really cool character arc there. I kind of like that. And so, um, like, all three of these, I'm sure, are supposed to be, like, you know, really powerful, cool heroes. But, like, of all three, he's the one to me who says, like, whoa, you get to play as that guy? That's cool. Um, but what you, get <laughs> right. for, what you get for $10 is um, that character swap. Cool. Uh-huh. You get a custom, car- or a custom card back, which, you know, those are kind of collectibles. So. Meh. Meh. Um, and then the other thing you get, which actually this is a bit of a criticism I have for it, I'd actually rather they not do this. Um, they come with animated portraits, like the golden cards that you get. They get like the sort of the animated stills mm-hmm, going yeah. on. The animated portrait, the animated um, hero power icon um, right off the bat. What I'd rather they do is have that be there, but unlocked in the same way that you do with all the other classes. Because what you have to do is win 500 ranked battles in order to get the golden version of your hero, which unlocks the animation and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. It's, um, it, it says, like, hey, look, I'm really good with this class because I've won 500 games. Yeah. Whereas with this, it's just like, oh, look, I pay $10 and I've got something shiny. You know, so I have a feeling that, gonna, I have a feeling that a lot of hardcore Hearthstone players are actually not going to buy them because they'd rather have the, um, the status statement of, I won 500 games rather than I pay $10. Yeah. Um, and so even if it was, like, I paid my ten dollars. I got the normal portrait, and if I happen to have already had five hundred ones with Mage, mm-hmm. then he's animated. And that means, look, I paid ten dollars, and I'm really awesome. So, do you think that there's that that the price is set where it is so that it can be restricting? I think it might be because um, it's certainly going to keep me from doing it. Yeah, and that, I, that's the, that's the interesting thing. I think if it was too cheap, you'd have everyone and their grandmother with all these new heroes and it would not really have much novelty. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I have a feeling that a lot of people are going to look at anyone who does have the new heroes. It's kind of like that doof has spent $10 on nothing. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, I mean like at least if you're spending money on packs, you're getting new cards or you're getting, you know, the dust to go make more new cards. Yeah. At least with the adventures, you're actually getting gameplay and you're actually able to get these exclusive cards that come for that set. But with this, it's literally just cosmetic. 
and uh-huh. it's very expensive for what, yeah. what they're giving you. Yeah, I mean, if they had given, I don't know, alternate card art or something like that, that that might have been kind of cool too, but well, there is the alternate card back. Well, but yeah, but the back, I don't know. The back do, just do you doesn't mean like um, me. aesthetic swaps for like a lot of like the actual yeah like, for, cards for the related um, cards. Mm. In other words, for for now, the class that, cards, that would be interesting. Is if there were like say for instance on Medivh, you get like also five exclusive mage class specific cards yeah with alternate art mm-hmm. or not maybe not even oh art. you're saying powers yeah with powers yeah and you, now, may, of you could that, choose to yeah. or not to mm-hmm. use them use them yeah see that makes sense to me mm-hmm. that I would actually purchase that mm-hmm. uh, so Blizzard uh, who <laughs> just, of course just add special cards to your heroes and it's done it's perfect our yeah. loyal listeners <laughs> to the backward compatible dot yes. com everyone podcast. listens to us clearly um <laughs> That is our challenge to you, and uh, go do that, please. Thank because it, it, in kind of a similar way, they had um, class-specific cards that you would unlock through Nox Ramus and through Black Rock Mountain with the class challenges, um, where they were um, you know, cards made for your class that you had to unlock through yeah. those challenges. And so basically, if they had did the same thing here, where you have however many cards that you can actually play that come with that character. No, that makes total um, sense. And Actually, you could even do it in the in the form of a class challenge. Mm. Oh yeah, um, you're, what you're buying is the the new guy mm. and a couple of class challenges. Uh, almost like yeah, like almost like a, in the same way that you can they tell a story in mm-hmm. the adventures. Um, you tell a very short story about your character to maybe introduce them to people who don't who know they, who they are. We should be game designers. Yeah, we should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone hire us. <laughs> Uh, the desperation of the graduate student. Mm. Don't worry. When you're my age, uh, you'll realize that uh, being unemployed is actually the <laughs> the pinnacle of transcendent game design philosophy. So there you mm. go. There you go. You just have to learn to not eat. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, it, it, it almost related to um, uh, those like vows of poverty that you take when you're religious. You yes, know? exactly. When, when it's become, like being a monk. Yeah. When you become a monk, you take the vow of poverty and. Uh, the problem is that nobody is willing to provide for you if you're just a <laughs> game designer with a vow. You know, actually, that explains a lot. If gamers have taken like a, a, a vow of, I don't know, uncleanliness, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, that would explain a lot of the guys that I see on Saturday afternoon when we mm. play up at uh, at the game store. So, not going to name names. <laughs> <laughs> well, not the ones we hang out with. Yeah, They're course. clean people. Yes. I like them. <laughs> But no, when the magic tournament occurs, the you know, when the wall of smell goes mm-hmm. up, ooh, yeah. my. it's like you know, I, I I don't, you really want to fight against the stereotypes of gamers, but then when that happens, it's like guys, you're not helping the the brand image right now, you know? <laughs> it's like, uh, so. it's so true, it's mm-hmm. it's so true. But you know, to be fair, some people use that as a as a strategy, mm. as an actual tourney strategy, because mm. you know, if you can't stand and sit across the table from me because of how bad I smell, mm-hmm. you're gonna forfeit. <laughs> well, on a related note, kind of bringing it back to Hearthstone, I've actually wondered <laughs> if there are people who intentionally take forever on their turns to see if they can just get the other person to get fed up. I'm and convinced leave. that's true. <laughs> I've, I've been tempted to conduct the experiment myself just to see if mathematically it's it's viable mm. um, and how high you could get doing it. Just, wait for, is, just wait for the timer to go out every time. Yeah, yeah, the problem with that is it would require me to be a complete and total Ass, yeah. and I refuse. <laughs> absolutely refuse yeah. to to conduct that experiment. So. At least, at least not under your current username. <laughs> you I'm gonna get another free account just so I can do it. Yep. Cool. Uh, so yeah, that's the the kind of the the top three mobile um, games that have been our on our radar. Mm-hmm. Um, what I wanted to kind of close out with the, was the thought of this: um, What do you think makes a good game because some of the criticism for for example um fallout shelter has been uh yeah it's a number one seller but it highlights all the worst things about mobile apps Mm. and i I think i personally would identify three types of mobile games okay the type that is a game that has been out and I, i touched on this briefly whenever i was talking about days of wonder um games like um carcassonne uh one of my personal favorites to play with my wife uh, and also another one that we play is small world mm-hmm. and these are apps we happily bought bought all the expansions for and really enjoy yeah. and i would probably throw um the uh, 
Ticket to Ride mm-hmm. series out there. I too. did enjoy those the are, Ticket to Ride app. Yeah, that's, actually, are, I, that's how I played the game for the first time. Those are a lot of fun, and and I think I mentioned last week that um, Summoner Wars was mm-hmm. on my yep. uh, my list that I had just picked up a, a hard copy of it. Mm-hmm. Still looking forward to playing it, but it's in cardboard boxes because I'm moving right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of that is to say. That's one type of game. Is that it's a it's a game that exists in you know on tabletop format and it has been brought over into the game space. Mm-hmm. Some of them very successfully and some of them very interestingly. Uh, I would actually look at Space Hulk mm-hmm. as an example of one that takes all afternoon to play whenever you play on the table, but you can actually play a, an entire round in fifteen minutes because all the dice rolling is done. Yeah. And then suddenly the campaign becomes something you can do in an afternoon. Oh, cool. As opposed to what's sitting. And so it changes it. So dungeon crawls are, are mm-hmm. kind of an example there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I guess the other one would be Warhammer Quest, which is a fantastic app. It's an mm-hmm. absolutely brilliant app that mirrors the original game just almost point for point. And that translation is great and it's got great art. Mm-hmm. So that's type one. Okay. The type that's translated into a mobile space and might or might not reflect the gameplay, um, dilated. Mm-hmm. Type two would be something along the lines of um, the transmedia extended experience kind of a thing, where um, it's in and of itself a game, but it, um, like Fallout Shelter, is really just existing to keep us in the consciousness of the Fallout universe until four comes out. Um, and there's tons of examples of these. Um, little app versions of, of various things. I mean, we've had guests on in the past that have talked about how their experience with a particular game was the mobile version, and they didn't know that it was different. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and that that was just kind of interesting. And so you could even... I, I would say the precursor to mobile games is uh, portable games. Talk about Game Boy and things like that, right? So we could talk about the differences between... And actually, last week we did... Uh, Zelda mm-hmm. and the Game Boy versions of Zelda, mm-hmm. right? And you could make the comparisons there, that it exists in order to, to keep us in that universe. But then the, the last thing is support apps. Mm-hmm. Like uh, I've mentioned in the past, I'm a huge Assassin's Creed fan. Mm-hmm. And you've got the Assassin's Creed companion app for um, four, for, for Assassin's Creed 4, where you could see your little ship on the map, on the mini-map, and it almost felt like a DS, mm-hmm. in the sense that you've got your iPad in front of you, you've got your controller in your hand, and you've got the big screen, and you're, you're literally second screening mm-hmm. all one game. Um, so it's a, it changes fundamentally changes the experience, mm-hmm. but it's still part of the original game. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, or it's um, a companion app that's meant to, in kind of the same way, the thing that keeps it on your mind. It It's something that like you can sort of do when you're not playing the game but it also feeds back into Well, that's very true, actually. Um, Brotherhood, mm-hmm. to use another Assassin's Creed example, had a, an app where you could send your, your little minions off, your, your, your assassins off, mm-hmm. and keep that up. And by the time you got back to your console, then your stats had gone up. Because, yeah, of, yeah that's a good point. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mass Effect 3 also did that. Um, oh, did it? I yeah. didn't know that. Um, uh, NBA 2K15 uh, and 14, uh, maybe several others, had companion apps where you could actually... Um, I think there was like a little standalone game for that. Um, that was like My Team Mobile or something like that. I never hmm. played it. I didn't but know But there either. was also, um, uh, you can earn virtual currency, which is the in-game currency used to basically um, buy upgrades. Uh, um, you can buy that actually as in-app purchases in the console version or the PC version. Mm-hmm. Um, or you can earn some bonus stuff for free via the app. Um, That's cool. Which I've actually done because it's nice. I, I walk away from... 2k for a few weeks for instance because i don't have time to play mm-hmm. it and by the time i get back i've accumulated like you know 10,000 20,000 bc which i can use to boost my character and be able to play better faster oh that's neat <clears throat> so it's kind of neat so you've built your um, little empire and, mm-hmm. it, and it keeps making money for you when you're away in a way yeah that's cool um i mean i still have to go in there and like manually like you know do like you, you pick like three of these little cards and you can like combine them together to get bonuses and stuff like that okay but, yeah that makes sense. um but the conspicuously missing from your three categories i think is the made for mobile game, which is a game that's not transmedia. Maybe you are limiting transmedia, so maybe that's why I'm missing this, but um, uh, made, you know, a game that's made for mobile to be played on mobile because it's mobile. You know, if that makes sure, sense. Sure, yeah. Um, example. Example, um, Clash of Clans, um, Monument Valley. I mean, some of these two have been cross-platform. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but um, the ones that are, you know, made to be a mobile game and not necessarily meant to be an adaptation of a board game or made to be a supplement to another game, anything like that. Oh, it makes perfect sense, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and yeah, you're right. That that was conspicuously missing from my list. Um, mostly because I don't play them very often. True. Fair enough. Um, I find mm-hmm. myself instead of playing Clash of Clans, playing the Star Wars version, mm-hmm. um, which was called like Clash of Empire or something like that. Yeah, I don't remember what it was called. Oh, Angry Birds, obvious example of made from. Oh Marvel. yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, um, Infinity Blade. Um, another good one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of really good ones out there. Um, a lot of not-so-good ones as well. <laughs> well <that's laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I mean, I think something else that's interesting, too, and, you know, the kind of the, the purpose of the games um, across those three, four categories um, is going to determine how their approach to this will be, which is monetization, if there is monetization at all. Um, and of course, some apps are the traditional model of pay five dollars, you own the app, and you're done. Um, right. Some of them are free, but with ads. Some of them are you know free, but you can pay to not have ads. Um, some of them are designed to pull money out of your wallet on a daily basis. Um, yeah, no kidding. If they're designed ideally, or if it's being played ideally, um, on and on and on. Um, and I think you know like. A lot, uh, a lot of people have a bad taste in their mouth now because of the, so many um, mainstream mobile games being the type that want to um, just micro transition you or micro transaction you to death, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and even uh, Fallout Shelter, I noticed um, I haven't played much of it, but it seemed to me there was a thing where you can purchase additional lunch boxes, okay. which then gives you um, you know more cards that you can use in the game and that sort of. I thing. don't. I don't really see that there's a need for it, though. I don't. I, don't think I haven't so found. Well, now, some of these games, like, um, oh, what's it called? It's called like uh, something of war. It's got the famous model mm-hmm. who isn't actually in the I th- game. I think it's just called Game of War. Game of War. That's yeah. what it is. Uh, game of War. Every every time I go to Facebook, every time I play like Words with Friends, mm-hmm. I see that you know, one of the many many ads mm-hmm. for Game of War. Yeah, I've never played it, mm-hmm. but my understanding is it's a lot of fun until you hit that funding wall, mm-hmm. and it becomes extremely clear that there is a gap between the people who have paid mm-hmm. and those who have not. Mm-hmm. And suddenly you've get, gotten to that point where you're going to have to wait a couple of days for something to mature or grow mm-hmm. or finish. And you can pay to have it finished quickly, Mm -hmm. or you can play the long Mm -hmm. haul. And kind of relating back to Hearthstone, because I think we've mentioned at some point that, you know, I I think in general we agree that Hearthstone does the free-to-play model well. Yeah. Um, And part of it is because we're already used to the idea of paying for booster packs for cards. Well, that's a good point. Um, Speaking of magic. Yeah. Um, So, you know, we're not necessarily opposed to that idea inherently. Um, if if that hadn't been an established idea, we might not like it because it's just like, oh, it's just another microtransaction model. Um, yeah. But that being said, um, you know, I think they've balanced the game well enough that you know, while you might not be able to be able to compete on a legendary level or whatever, um, with the cards that you can get, um, just even in the basic set, if you can build a good basic deck, you can be fairly competitive. Oh yeah, you can. You can, you can hold your own, and you can. Um, there are still ways for you, and of course a lot of these games do the same thing, where there are ways to earn in-game currency in-game without paying. It's just you can do it faster if you pay. Um, but you know, Hearthstone, I think, does a pretty good job of making you feel like you don't have to buy packs. Right. Well, i got to say, if I was forced with a choice, mm-hmm. uh, well, let's say you, you handed me $100 and you said, you have to spend this money on buying cards. Mm-hmm. I would rather buy virtual cards in Hearthstone than buy actual cards of any game of your choice Mm -hmm. for the simple reason that when I get repeats in Hearthstone, I can disenchant them. Mm -hmm. And it turns into magic dust, which I can then create a new card with. Yep. That, to me, is the brilliance, the absolute genius Mm -hmm. of the Hearthstone model. Mm -hmm. Um is you're never stuck with those extra cards. I mean, I know for a fact that uh, our friend Richard Mm -hmm. funded his way through college by selling not just his deck, Mm -hmm. but... Managing other people's magic collections. Yeah, 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 because he was a champion. I Mm -hmm. forget at what level, regional at least. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, because of his notoriety, people were were handing him their extras, Mm -hmm. whole decks, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of cards, and he was taking a cut off the top, mm-hmm. as he rightly should have, mm-hmm. selling them. And I mean, and, and that's because you have all this extra wasted physical paper yeah. 
of the pulls. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the reason why I got out of the Star Wars minis back in the day, and why I uh, my very first alternate reality game was actually um, Perplexity. Mm-hmm. It was the Perplexity game, right? Perplex City, right? right. <laughs> and uh, it had cards, physical cards, and I and I got out of it whenever I opened up. I think it was uh, fourteen packs. Mm-hmm. And they weren't cheap. Mm-hmm. And I had, like, one new card out of mm-hmm. the whole thing. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm done collecting. And that's why I really like the idea of, um, you know, Fantasy Flight Games has the model of the LCG instead of the TCG. Or yeah, CCG. the living card game Living model. card game. Yeah. Which is you give a, a core set, which has a certain number of cards uh, to fit the design of the game. And then they come out with expansions that are, in this expansion, you get these cards. And you know what you're getting. Um, and you know it's not going to be... Like in order in order to get the complete expansion that we just released, the like the new season, if you will, um, to use like you know magic terminology, mm-hmm. um, uh, you ha- you're going to have to buy um, you know a hundred booster packs and right. hope that maybe you get half of it. You know? Right. <laughs> so well, to be fair, Fantasy Flight was brilliant with one aspect of that, and it's they attached it to a very well known uh, IP, mm-hmm. which was. The Game of Thrones, yeah, Game of Thrones, and now Lord of the Rings. Uh huh. Um, I think they also have Netrunner now, which I think is maybe an original one. Um, I'm no, not sure. That if sounds it is right, there. but it doesn't matter because mm-hmm. at this point we know what a living card game is, yes. and we yeah. know that it works. Yeah. And so, um, but anyway, that said, I think personally, to to answer uh, a question that's been on my mind of late, and I think I brought it up last week, are we do for a crash, mm. for a board game crash? And I think the answer is no. There may be a little bit of a dip mm-hmm. whenever it comes to physical sales of physical copies of physical games. Um, we may see less, or we may see more. We may see different types of games. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but what we definitely are going to see is more games existing in the virtual digital space that don't exist now. Mm-hmm. And that upsets Ian greatly. Yeah, it does. My son. <laughs> Fortunately, his mommy is, is yes. as always, mm-hmm. on duty to yes. take care of him. Just in, in general, assume on the podcast, if you hear baby crying, it's not because we're being neglectful. It's because we're not on duty. Exactly. It has <laughs> so. nothing to do with the fact that we're being neglectful. Wait, no, I said that wrong. <laughs> I know. Uh, but yeah, no, I think I, I, think I agree that... Um, I don't think board games are ever really going to go out of style in the sense that... Um, you know, even if it's not, you know, paper and cardboard, right? Um, it can still be on mobile. And, you know, when you don't have to actually produce physical copies of something, that's an advantage um, as far as putting something out there. And basically all you have to spend is the time and money it takes to produce the game, design the game. Um, and, of course, that requires some, maybe some more technical expertise than it does just to go into Photoshop and make your board. Well, sure, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but if you can get an app out there, you can put an app out there essentially for free. Um, with no startup costs, whereas a board game does require um, that money. But, you know, I think even just the mechanics of board games and card games um, still appeals. Um, you know, take Hearthstone as an example. You know, right. That was a made-for-digital card game, but it's something that doesn't require... Um, it's turn-based. It doesn't require reflex. It requires thought and strategy. Yeah. Um, and I think there's an appeal still to people, especially people who are more casual gamers, to not feeling intimidated by the speed of a game or needing to learn how to mm-hmm. control your character, just knowing that here is um, a choice you have to make mechanically or mm-hmm. narratively, and you just make that choice. Um, and so I think that you know, even if board games completely go out of existence for some reason because we all have the little electronic paper and tablets and stuff like that um, of the future. Um, you know, and everything is just published on there. Um, you know, I think board games as an idea will still be around. Hey, I'll just be glad when Sabic exists. <laughs> I've been waiting for that one for years. Mm-hmm. And little fan-made versions have cropped up every now and then. Mm-hmm. But. Actually, that would be... Since Fantasy Flight has the license to Star Wars, why has there not been, like, an official Sabic? I don't know. It's a great question, the, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That'd be interesting. Um, well, I think the answer is they don't do video games. Sabak, mm-hmm. by its nature, um, if you know the lore, mm-hmm. shifts. It's a mm-hmm. digital game, much like Hearthstone, mm-hmm. wherein the values of the cards and characters change based on mm-hmm. what's going on dynamically. Oh, good point. Yeah. So, so it can't exist as a physical so card So EA game. can get on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, go. Disney can get on it at this point. Oh, yeah. I mean, they can do whatever That's they want point, now. Yeah. But, uh, so, no, I, I think, did they have Sabak in uh, Knights of the Old Republic? 
They might have. It was like a, it was like a side thing you could do. So. If they if they did, I don't remember that. Mm. You, you could be right. Mm. I think they did have that, but it wasn't probably nearly as fleshed out as a game that would be designed. Like it's Sawbuck the game, right? Not you can play Sawbuck as a side thing. And yeah, Kotor. that makes sense. But anyway, that makes sense. But cool. Well, I think it's about time for us to start winding things down. So wind, wind, wind. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for BackwardCompatible.com podcast number 32. Uh, I'm Chris, and I've been joined here today by Doc. All right. And uh, you might have heard the sounds of Arwen in the background, so we warned you. Um, and again, once more, if you're willing to um, take a look at the GoFundMe for uh, Kim Worth, um, again, we were posting a link down in the description, uh, GoFundMe.com slash K-Y-M-W-I-R-T-H. Um, help our buddy Richard out. Uh, I'm sure it'd be very much appreciated. Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, what mobile games have you been playing lately and what do you like or dislike about them? Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible.